sexually. Maybe that's why gay men are more ready for it. Because to be actually receptive to God, he, she, you know, God doesn't have a gender, but on the other hand, in the scriptural imagery, and in fact, in the, in the experience, God, as we just heard in exercise <coughs> earlier this morning, takes the initiative. Right. And we, uh, it's often said the human soul is female, uh, we, male or female, are receptive to God's act. Well, God is the lover. Like Peter, when he was getting his feet washed, he, well, yeah. he thought that was Putin. Yeah, and, and it's true that Jesus and the Rama, you know, are, are male, even in the human sense, but God is herself, himself, whatever is beyond gender, and still, in, in practice, has that, uh, takes the initiative, uh, ravishes us, you know, with his love, you know. And uh, that's a real threat to the men. That's one reason they so hate gay men, because it's, you're not real men, you're scaring us to death, because we have this feminine side in us as well. It's a threat, yeah. and, so, so, really has, as you're bringing up, this whole imagery, this whole reality, you know, of sexuality and, and, and gender roles, you know, is really tied up with mysticism. And when we can get beyond, you know, to, to real psychological and spiritual health to integrate all these things in ourselves, so we're no longer threatened, either by people who are different from ourselves, or by God, coming into our lives. And look at the Song of Songs, this wonderful text in the, in the Jewish scriptures, which both Jews and, and Christians were reluctant to put into the canon of scripture because it was so sensual. And it doesn't even mention God. It doesn't have to. You find God in, in the experience. Huh? So that's what contemplation is, too. You don't even talk about God or have a concept of God. You just experience God. So, you know, in the love between two people, uh, you find God, which somehow is actually in Scripture. When John says, whoever loves, doesn't say whoever loves God, he says, whoever loves is born of God and knows God. I've preached on that so many times because it's just astounding. I mean, that's a world-shattering and mind-shattering statement. Whoever loves knows God and is born of God. And born of God. Because God is love. And that's already a, 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 you know, mind-boggling. God is love. That's, that's it. You got it. Or you didn't. God is love. So whoever loves knows God and is born of God. So we've got to listen to our experience here. So when you get, for example, a gay or a lesbian person discovering him or herself, discovering the, the, the pull to love, you know, the attractions of love, the, they're letting their heart become vulnerable and, and defenseless in the face of another. And feeling the vulnerability and the tenderness and the, the tentativeness of, of their own heart and their, uh, how, and their own emotions. And how delicate and how fragile that is. And to, to, to venture out and to discover you know, the, beauty, uh, the beauty of it, the possible beauty of it. And then have someone come along and say, that's, hard, that's bad. That's objectively disordered or whatever. Uh, that's a horrible, horrible thing to do to a person. Because we're missing, we're missing what the scriptures and what, what, God, what God is all about. You know, that love it surpasses everything. Jesus' final commandment, one final commandment I give you before I pass to the Father, love one another as I have loved you. Share my own love for the Father, our own love affair, uh, which isn't you know, male and female, it's the Trinity. You know, who can figure that out? So all sorts of uh, alternative uh, lifestyles, beginning with the Trinity. Um, so to, to, to experience that and to realize that's what we're all, uh, what we're all called to. So when you hear, as, as I, I like that phrase, I like that, I mean, I, I was struck by that phrase, which you may have heard, you know, I, before, you know, when gays couldn't serve in the military, you know, I received a medal for killing a man and a discharge for loving one. Wow. Have we got our priorities screwed, skewed, skewered, you know, when we think that killing is better than loving? Well, love is going to be manifest, you know, within the church by people listening to one another, listening to one another's experience, listening to 
it's a, to dialogue, in other words. This is where all of us, leaders of the church and others, have to manifest that love by listening to one another, embracing one another, and hearing one another's experience. It's respect for the person, which is how love is shown in one way. And that's what's behind Pope Francis is saying, you know, who am I to judge? Uh, because who is he to judge? No one can judge anyone else. And I think Pope Francis' Jesuit formation, which gave him a sense of spirituality, respect for the other, contemplation, uh, uh, yes, and then personal concern, core personalis, as the Jesuit would say, care for each individual, uh, would allow that kind of respect and that kind of openness to hear one another's experience. Uh, I know of, actually know of one, uh, one contemporary bishop uh, who was prevailed upon to have a dialogue with a gay couple and hear their story from a Christian point of view, a Catholic point of view, and he remarked privately, of course, privately. He remarked privately afterwards, how can we call people like that objectively disordered? So what transforms hearts is when you really actually do hear people's experience and learn about their struggles to love. When you have uh, Catholic leaders or Catholic bishops say, as they still do sometimes, well, the gay people have an agenda, and they're not loyal Catholics, and they're not, uh, they're picking and choosing the faith, and uh, they're, uh, they're yielding to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the cultural uh, you know, pressures of the time. Uh, that is really, really disrespectful. That's demeaning, and uh, that's uh, not taken seriously at all. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's contemptuous, really, uh, condescending. Where uh, Paul uh, uses a phrase of acting uh, parafusin in Greek, which means, well, what does it mean? That's the point. What does it actually mean? And he seems to be talking about people who have um, been idolaters and therefore God gave them up to their, their wrongful behavior. Uh, so only idolaters can be homosexuals? Well, that doesn't sound right. Uh, so he seems to be maybe talking about temple prostitution. That's another thing. But the phrase parafusin against, you know, what does it mean? Like, alongside nature is what it means. They're acting alongside nature. Against nature? Well, on the, on, on the edge of nature. And if any text was ever used to say it was unnatural, that was. Hmm? That's actually, as I'm going to say a little bit later, not why people were calling it unnatural. It was, a whole, it was a whole philosophy. It wasn't really scripture. But if any scriptural text could be used to support the idea that it was a little uh, on the edge of nature or against nature, it could be that. Uh, but as, as that film points out, it really just means what's not really customary. It's not the usual thing. Come out and say, I, I don't experience this as something bad. I think there's something wrong with the way we're interpreting scripture, which I just tried to point out. And also something, the way, something wrong with the way we're, 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 we're carrying on tradition. So let me especially say, let me also say a, a word about that, scripture tradition. The connecting point here, a good connecting point, is that in theology, uh, all the, 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 the sexual rules, all the sexual reasoning, etc., falls under, in the Ten Commandments, de sexto, it was called, sometimes with a, with a whisper. De sexto. In any case, uh, all it talks about is adultery. So you can't connect the whole schema of our Catholic moral theology to the Sixth Commandment. It's just not there. And in fact, if you ask justification for this or that rule, they won't quote scripture, generally. Uh, I had a young gay man last year uh, who had come to me for direction, uh, ask me, after I'd explained some of these scripture te texts, how come the church, the contemporary church, doesn't make more use of this? And I said, well, you know, it would shake things up too much. If a sincere person, a sincere gay person, for example, is struggling with his or her own inner discovery, and then says, well, let me look at scripture, oh, doesn't say what it's always said it was. Then you look at tradition, they say, oh, it doesn't make sense anymore in, in, if you look at it from this point of view. Well then, wow, then maybe my, my experience does have some validity. 
And he's not, this person is not picking and choosing, not a cafeteria Catholic. He's simply saying, on the level of truths, and their traditional theology, again, their levels of truth, not everything is infallible. Uh, this is on shaky ground, according to the way it's been presented to me and has present, been presented over the, over the centuries, then I actually have, that's not, a, 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 not only a right, but a duty, maybe even, to start questioning this. And to say, well, maybe my experience, what Jesus is saying to me now, what the Spirit is saying to or the church is now, to use the phrase from the book of Revelation, is something really important that I need, we need to hear. But, but in my estimation, this is the, I found to be the best book ever on, on this particular, the one of the trilogy of the gay soul. Um, Finding the Heart of Gay Spirit and Nature, 16 writers, healers, teachers, and visionaries who contributed to their uh, essays. Um, now, I, I want to point out that in all these cases, and as you see in the bibliography also, uh, not everything in these books is compatible, uh, you know, strict with strict church, church teaching. Uh, uh, so, So it's, it's, it's very powerful, sexual imagery, and we shouldn't be, and gay people are good at this, shouldn't be ashamed of that kind of language, we should feel comfortable with it in our own experience, bodily and spiritual, you know, spiritual including the body, in the sense it's a normal way of being human for a minority of the population. So you're not outside of, you know, reality in that sense. But it's, it's virtual, and uh, virtually normal, because it's uh, a minority position. But it's, uh, so outsiders in that sense, uh, they never have, it's changing now, of course, with gay marriage and gay adoption, but you, you, you won't live the kind of human life uh, that's expected, that's approved, that's uh, normal for the majority. Uh, so outsiders mirroring society, and therefore, if you want to speak in religious terms, Judeo-Christian terms, exercising a prophetic mission of speaking out not just for uh, uh, honesty and truth and integrity, but for the outsider. All the other outsiders that are encountered. Gay people have a head start in religious and social and psychological terms uh, at uh, standing up for the outsider. And somebody, I think, what's his name? Jesus. Didn't Jesus do that? <laughs> uh, I think Jesus was kind of known that in our own ministry. You know,
time, he grew up in India from British parents, so he had that inter international, interspiritual thing from the beginning. This now considers himself a Shivaite, Hindu, but with a you know strong sense of Christianity as well, especially Mary. Um, he uh, he's, a, he's a great activist, and he has a, a video and also a book called Sacred Activism, part of the bibliography. But uh, he mentions uh, very much this this this, this uh, importance of being rooted in rooted in our divine identity, uh, in our in our union with God, uh, but also. Uh, the rise of compassion and nonviolence is envisioned by Mahatma as one of the great signs of our times in the global spirituality and also of a gay spirituality. Any spirituality, as I said, is only one spirituality. So did, did God have sexual? 
who cares? God clearly doesn't care. You know, the word, whatever that even means. God doesn't speak in terms of word. Literally. No, no, no. Because that's God loves us when we're his enemies, the same Paul says. So he loves us all the time. God cannot not love us. And he does the centurion sign. Well, of course. <laughs> I'm not worried you come under my roof, but uh, so he doesn't have a business too, no less. So, if, if you want, don't don't think about what you're saying. Yeah, just I just just say use that. it as a way of opening your. I own never say that. I say I never say I am not worthy. I say, even though sometimes I feel that I'm not worthy, you make me ready through your will and the heal the mind, body, and soul. Okay. So that's so what that works for you. Works for you. Right. I just get out of the whole worthiness game entirely. Yeah. If you read the, uh, the verses that were kind of omitted in between today, it, it's this famous, or it should be famous, image of the olive tree. And he says that the Jewish covenant was the, was, the, was the natural olive, the true olive tree. And the Gentiles have been grafted on, kind of stuck together. I mean, how is this going to work? It doesn't seem natural. It doesn't seem right. And he does use the phrase parafusis, which means not exactly against nature, but alongside nature, not, not what's expected, not what's supposed to work, not what's supposed to be right, bringing in the Gentiles. Remember, he says to us Gentiles, you don't support the, brand, the, 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 the tree, the tree supports you. Interestingly, the same phrase, and I just point this out in passing, the very same phrase, paraphrasis, is used in chapter 1, talking about activity, which today we speak about referring to homosexuality. He uses the same phrase, as Parafusis. Again, against nature is too strong a translation. It's more like alongside nature. Not what we'd expect. Not what's, not what's customary. Not what's supposedly right. Is there a connection? Same phrase. By the same author in the same letter. It should wake us up to the fact that there are things we don't understand that are going to blow our minds that are going to bring us out of our comfort zone, not what's expected, supposedly contrary to what God said in the beginning, the very thing. So how are we not seeing these things? Well, I guess we're not seeing them because maybe even Jesus didn't. And, and it's gone to the most incredible extremes. Someone pointed out recently, I think again accurately, that just as in the Republican Party today, there's this extreme far right called the Tea Party with the most, ex with the most extreme and outrageous and almost apocalyptic language sometimes. Well, similarly, we heard at the Senate, and to quote the Holy Father, he said, you know, some of the interventions were uh, unfortunately not very well meaning. You have the same kind of extreme far right apocalyptic language. What is wrong with us? that we so miss the gospel is sometimes especially those who are, should know better, like Jesus' own disciples, the religious authorities. Because whatever you don't face in yourself, very elementary psychologically, whatever you don't face in yourself, you project outwards onto all those sinners out there, onto all those who are unworthy, onto all those who don't follow the law, all those immigrants, all those Muslims, all those gay people, whatever it might be, they're the sinners. And we are the righteous ones. We uphold the law. And you become cruel and judgmental and violent.
But as long as what, in whatever tradition we cling to our thought systems and moral systems and devotional systems and cultural expectations and cultural expressions as if they were absolutes, well, this is relativism. Uh, it sounds too much like relativism. Yes, it's relativism. Everything that's manifested in this world is relative. Nothing is absolute. At the last synod, one of the cardinals got up and said, well, you know, this, the gays today, they're just like the Nazis were in the 20th century. Was that so? You know what I think is like the Nazis in the 20th century? Statements like that. So what survives that the Son of Man can truly come? This generation must not pass away. You must not pass away before all these things are accomplished in you and in me. So that we can finally shine like the Son in the Kingdom of the Father. So just as you have to, as Jung says, you have to find, and this is true for any relationship to succeed, if you want to go back down on those different levels here, you have to find the masculine-feminine balance in yourself and not be looking for it in another person. Same is true, you have to find the balance, you know, uh, the absolute relative in yourself as well. So you're the whole thing. Samantabhadra and Samantabhadri. You're this Rama, Krishna, and, the, you know, the, the Dainis, whatever they're called. You know, you're, you're, you're both at the same time, and so is whatever partner you're dealing with. So that should open up a few things about gender and homosexuality and everything else, by the way. So it's really important to realize that each of you or all of you are, are one, uh, everything at the same time. Yeah, and you, you see the Bernini statue is pictured as like an, like an orgasmic thing. And even John of the Cross, by the way, speaks about this is one level of it, you know, when you have a, 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 a deep spiritual experience of union with God, you can actually have like a sexual reaction in your body. So that's, that shows the connection, but also the disconnect, you know, that it's not yet fully integrated. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, so even Christian mystics speak about that, but generally the conclusion they draw is, you know, within the framework of the whole thing that we learned, you know, about the higher and the lower, of, you know, this is bad and this is good, so it's, it's not exactly healthy. Uh, but it does testify to the, uh, to the connection of the energy. Then is a form of Buddhism devoted to human growth through meditation. It can be practiced by men and women of any faith or no faith. The future of Zen Buddhism depends largely on the quality of its teachers. Teaching is passed on personally, as you will see, from one teacher to another. Michael requests to be a Zen teacher, and I approve his request for the full I gave Michael his, the name that he has chosen, Ko Yu, which means the dragon of light. The dragon is an entirely positive symbol in Asia and in Zen studies. It stands for human energy and insight. Michael Oran is the eighth fourth generation of teachers from the time of the Buddha. Do you remember our teachers today? Bye, Kibutu. Bye,